Pastor. Love you too. Good evening. Man, feels good to be in here. It feels good to be in Tucson. Yeah, uh, it's already getting cold where I come from, and we were by the pool today, so that was kind of (laughs) nice. Oh, man. Um, It's an honor to be back here with y'all tonight, and especially to be here on one of these Wednesday night United gatherings. I know you've come from all over the city here just to be here, and you like to pray. Is this true? (laughs) Okay, good, because I'm going to talk about prayer tonight. And uh, what I would like to do, I, I was talking with Alex before the thing, and I gave him some, some photos that I'm going to show throughout the night. But if you could put up the first picture, I'm just going to start off things, uh, get things going here pretty quickly. Just put that up and just leave it up there if you can for me. Um, so if you like to pray, uh, Washington, D.C. maybe has been a part of your your prayer life at some point, I would uh, strongly urge you to make it a larger portion of your prayer life. Uh, As Pastor mentioned, we direct the Justice House of Prayer, and our founder, Lou Engle, uh, started this back in October. Do you guys know who Lou Engle is? Okay, awesome. One person clap. That's awesome. Um, But we, we began October 4th, 2004, so just This month, we crossed our 18th anniversary. We're 18 years old. That means we can vote. (laughs) We can also get drafted to go to war. I don't know. There's there's kind of a catch-22 there. But but anyway, we've been praying in, not just in Washington, D.C., but we're located right on Capitol Hill. And uh, our house of prayer currently is just about four blocks from the United States Supreme Court. So that's the building that you see there in the background. I've had the privilege of being there uh, and overheard numerous uh, like high school and, and middle school tours that come through and tell people that that's the White House. <laughs> that is not the White House. <laughs> but uh, this has been a, a big part of my life. For the last 18 years, we have been standing in front of that Supreme Court uh, with a a laser focus and praying, as Pastor mentioned, praying for the overturning of Roe v. Wade and for the ending of abortion in America. And so I am going to talk a little bit about that tonight, but the reason I I just feel blessed to be here with you to talk about it here is because uh, this house has been a tremendous blessing to our little ministry there on Capitol Hill and, and uh, Zion City has been faithful supporters of our work there. And so we just, it's an honor for us to be here just to show our gratitude. But also I just wanted to come with stories and testimonies, you know, and because I want, I want you to share in this as we see it, you know, cause you can turn on the news and you can see what all the talking heads are saying, but I just want to come with testimonies of what I've seen God doing. And I want you to enjoy that, to participate in it and, and really to kind of see it from maybe a, a unique perspective, uh, that you won't see on the news. And so this picture, oddly enough, you might've seen on the news. So that is a picture of me and that is my wife, Kim. And on the right side of the screen, that is my oldest daughter, Taylor. And this is her husband, Trace, that is beside her. And he is holding my first grandbaby. That's Liam. And uh, incidentally, it's actually, I just now thought of this. Uh, and so my daughter and her husband uh, are missionaries in the, full-time missionaries in the Middle East. And Zion City also uh, supports them as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, but anyway, this picture was taken on June 24th at exactly 10, 10 a.m. Does anybody know what happened at that moment? Well, you already know, don't you? So we've been standing there praying for 18 years, really with an audacious and sometimes what seemed like a ridiculous belief that God was going to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, time out. Let me just say this. And I, 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 I want to preface this whole night with this statement. 
that when we're talking about this subject matter, this is some of the most serious stuff that you can talk about and address, particularly in the church, in the culture for sure, but in the church, this, this is very intense. Um, and, and it's because we've all, we've all got our own histories. We all come to this moment with our own experiences. And so please hear my heart. Nothing I say tonight is, should be interpreted as putting any kind of judgment or condemnation on anybody for anything that has happened in your past. Amen. Amen. But we do find ourselves in a moment where God has just done something extraordinary. So this is my heart tonight is just to share this moment with you and what I see God doing in the nation. And so this moment is a really powerful moment for me because this is the moment that the opinion was released that Roe v. Wade was overturned. And I was standing there, you know, I wasn't just a passerby at this moment. I didn't just happen to be there at exactly 10, 10 a.m. on June 24th. We've been standing there for 18 years. So this moment was the culmination of much prayer. This, this moment was the culmination of a lot of tears, a lot of broken hearts, just because through the years, you know, my team asked me, like, you know, as we processed this the last three months, what was the most important lesson that we learned over these 18 years? And I, and I trust, what I'm, what I'm doing here tonight is I'm coming with testimonies, but I kind of want to just give you guys some, some ideas and thoughts from the hip here, because you're, pray, you're a praying church and you're a praying people. And I think there's going to be encouragement in what I have to share tonight that's going to help you and equip you for how to pray for your family, how to pray for your city, how to pray for Arizona, how to pray for this nation. But my, my team and I, we were processing this and we were wondering like, what, what's the big takeaway here? Like what, what, what is the biggest lesson that we learned over these 18 years? And this is gonna be kind of weird. We, we've boiled it down to you have to learn how to lose. And I'm, I wanna, I'm gonna dive into that topic a little bit with you tonight. It's hard to unpack it all just in one evening. But after 18 years, what I've realized is that you don't get to that moment right there unless you learn how to lose first. And, and so 18 years, we lost. Not always, sometimes there were like small victories, some medium-sized victories, but at the end of the day, we weren't there. And so how do you get to this moment? If you could actually go to the next image for me, please, Alex. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the, that first picture is, is my wife and I just embracing, but honestly, we were just sobbing in each other's arms. Psalm 126 is this brilliant passage of scripture where the exiles are returning and it, and it says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like men who dreamed. What does that mean? Literally, when you study the commentaries and even look at some of the Jewish commentaries on it, the understanding of that is that at the moment when the impossible suddenly breaks into the natural realm, what everybody tells you is impossible. Suddenly, when that gets manifested into reality and you see it, it's so far beyond what you thought God was capable of doing that you're like, pinch me, I must be dreaming. Because it's that good. So the men are coming back and they're seeing the restoration of all that had been lost and they're saying, pinch me, I must be dreaming. This is too good to be true. And so, I, you know, I feel like we were like men who dreamed, you know, in this moment because it exceeded and went so far beyond what we even, what we even thought was possible. And yet God was talking to us all along. And so my wife and I were sobbing in that moment. And I'll tell you a, a funny story, not so funny, but a story that goes along with this, you know, uh, the, like this is just like, you know, a minute later, and we're just praising the Lord. And what, here's what you can't see in this picture. This looks like on June 24th, it looks like we were there all by ourselves, doesn't it? False. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the news, 
uh, maybe from that day, but there are a few thousand protesters that are completely surrounding us, most of which I would say were, were uh, for the other side. Uh, the reason it looks like we're alone is because we're just kind of pressed up against the fence, uh, which was up against another fence. Man, this, the last year in Washington, D.C. has been weird. The last year and a half, honestly. We spent the last year and a half praying against razor wire. No, I'm not, I'm not joking. It's, it's just been the, the strangest, you know, year and a half. And yet, uh, you know, the fences went back up in May. You might be aware of that. So we're pressed up against the fence, my team and I. But we're completely surrounded by a few thousand protesters that are screaming profanities and, and things that, that aren't suitable to be repeated. But we're in this moment. And we just began to worship and thank God for what he has done. And we received communion right there. And, and we take communion. Every time we go to the court, we take communion and, 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 and we plead the blood of Jesus. But a couple of things about this moment, though, that, that really marked me was, was one, just uh, like when you're surrounded by the noise, now, apply this just to your normal day-to-day -day life. Listen, like you need to be able to find God in the chaos. When everything is screaming and cursing around you, you can find God in that moment. And, and we were here, and you know, I think one of the, the most amazing things that happened to us was we gathered up and we declared in that spot, surrounded by all of these people, and we said, God, we didn't do this. You did this. And whatever crown is being given out in this moment right now, what a pleasure and joy it is to rip that thing off and throw it at your feet right now. Because God, you did this. The second thing was that we, we received communion and there was about 12 of us there that day uh, from our team. And we just circled up in the middle of this crowd and we just began to give thanks to God and receive communion. But then there were others that came and they began to circle around us and just curse at us and hurl all manner of vile insults. And, and, and it was just, it was an interesting picture. And uh, I, I, I was like, you know, what's happening here? And you guys know this, when uh, Jesus was hanging on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you understand what he was saying right there? A lot of people misunderstand that. My, some people say, well, oh, the, 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 the sin of the world is on him and the father has to look away or whatever. That's not what's going on. He's quoting Psalm 22. Write that down. Do you know that that's what's happening right there? What, what he's saying is he quotes Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then you read the rest of it, and what he gets into in Psalm 22 is it says, all the strong bulls of Bashan have come down and encircled me. The dogs have come down to hurl their insults. And it, what he's talking about is it's the demonic realm. Literally, hell empties, and they come to gloat because they think that they have won over the Son of God. Little did they know they were reporting for their own judgment because he disarmed them and he humiliated them at the power of the cross, right? So this is, it was this amazing picture just on a personal level for us that we're standing here in the midst of, of, of all of these people that are shouting and jeering at us and we're receiving the body and the blood of Jesus. Powerful moments like this. But uh, something else happened here. And I want to ask my wife, Kim. This is my wife, Kim. Give her a warm welcome. And she's going to share just a story uh, from this moment, too. Real quick, regarding the people who were surrounding us and screaming at us. Um, just, it's interesting. Like, when you see your enemy, um, you got to see what's behind it, not the people that are doing it. Um, because what I hear when I hear them yelling at us and screaming at us, the kind of things they are, um, I think about the women that we work with from the pregnancy center who are post-abortive women. 
and they will say, I was that woman that was screaming and yelling at you. And it's just that they don't have the revelation. They don't have the forgiveness. They don't have all of that. And so you have to look past the people and see that they're hurting. Um, so anyway, we're there. We, that first picture that he showed, we were not just hugging each other. We were like literally sobbing. <laughs> and, and so and it went, went on for a couple of minutes. And then we were kind of, everybody else disappeared. That was a very private moment to us, even though there were thousands of people. And so right here, that happened. And then we turned to our team who had been standing beside us. Only our team wasn't standing beside us. It was a whole bunch of photographers. <laughs> and so for, for a very brief moment, it was like super shocking and violating to see them standing there. And they, immediately they all turned and walked away. And then one man comes back. He turns around and he just said, all politics aside, this was very special for me to be a part of. He said, I've been here for years, and I know you've been here for years. And he just said, I'm just... He just said, I'm just so thankful to be a part of this and get to see this. And he says, by the way, I see your daughter is married now. What's her last name? And so it was just like, at that moment, like, we always felt like we were invisible and nobody even knew we were there. And then it's just like, he knew we were there. And it was just it, this very interesting moment because everything had seemed so private. And then all of a sudden it's like, wow, it's all in the public. And then it showed up in the news. And <laughs> you're just like, wow, this is like so much more than I had anticipated and all of that. And so it was just, after a few days, we were like, okay, we're actually glad that we have that moment, that that moment was captured for us personally. <laughs> and yeah. so, but it was just interesting to hear that story from him. Yes. Thank you. Actually, when he, when he mentioned our daughter, that was, uh, that was significant because my daughter was 10 years old when we first moved to D.C. And so for him, him to even recognize her and say, I know you guys have been here that long, you know, that, that was really a special moment. But um, maybe we'll just leave that picture there for now, but we'll, we'll move on here. What I want to uh, maybe do is back up, and I want to talk about how we got there. I mentioned earlier that, you know, this important dynamic that you need to learn how to lose. And I want to kind of drill into that a little bit and, and explain it, hopefully, as best I can. But for me personally, this all began with a dream. Now, if, if you heard Will Ford when he was here, if you've ever heard Lou Engel or any, anything like that, you know that it's, it's all about dreams, man. <laughs> How many of you dream? Okay, I'm not talking about when it's late night pizza. I'm talking about like you go to sleep at night and you feel like the God of the universe is speaking your language. Okay, I see a few hands going up. The rest of you are just being shy. So I wasn't a dreamer, but in September of 2004, I had a dream. And in the dream, the Lord revealed to me his heart for the ending of abortion in America and how he was going to bring that about through day and night prayer. Now, it's not a small detail that in that dream there was a man named Lou Engel. But at that time in my life, I didn't know who that was. So that's a whole story in and of itself. But I want to share that dream with you because I just kind of want to lay it as a foundation for you to understand like why I've been doing this for the last 18 years. So in my dream, again, I'm, as I mentioned, like I was not a dreamer. I didn't have prophetic dreams, really, none that I remembered. But I had this very strange dream one night where I was in a room filled with young people. Kim and I were both there. And in this room, there was a huge chalkboard that went the full length of the room. And it was filled from top to bottom and edge to edge with facts and figures and numbers and information about abortion. And in the dream, all of these young people began to pray and they were holding chalkboard erasers. Now, let me just pause for a second. You think about a chalkboard eraser and all this stuff that's written on the chalkboard, you, you would almost assume that what they're gonna do is they're gonna step up and try to erase this information, but that's not what happened in the dream. In the dream, all of the young people stood up and they began to pray about what was written on the chalkboard. And every time they would say a prayer, they would step up and they would smack that eraser against the board. And the impact of it would make this cloud of white dust. 
And so I'm watching this happen, and the speed that this is happening is picking up. There's more and more, and, and I become aware in the dream that the prayers are all just now turning into one loud rumble that is not ending. It's, it's, it's unceasing prayer, and I know that it's going all day and all night. Some point in the dream, I look over, and there's this man. I know his name is Lou Engel, and I walk over to him, and I say, how do you function the next day after you do this all night? It's such a weird question, but it's a dream. You know, that's kind of how I'm wired too. It's like, how are you going to do this and do everything else? Is kind of what I was asking. And he looks at me, and if you know Lou, he goes, I don't know. <laughs> Some of you know who Lou Ingalls, you recognize the voice. But he says, I don't know. And he turns around and he hits the chalkboard even harder. And so this rhythm of prayer is going all night long. And at one point I look out a window and I see that the sun is coming up. And it's a new day. But then when I look back at the chalkboard, you can no longer read what was written on that chalkboard. And it's not because it was erased. When I look back, it's now been made completely white. And it was white from the impact of all of those prayers. Now, let me just interpret that for you a little bit. I didn't understand. It took me a long time to understand that dream. But here's the thing is, is when we're talking about abortion... In America, just abortion in general, you can't erase what has happened. We, we have taken 63 million lives since 1973. It's going on 64 million now. And that's why I think God was showing me this cannot be erased, but I believe it can be made white. So if you look at Isaiah chapter 1, the nation, God has... Uh, an indictment against the nation, and he summons them to a court case. And then this is where we say, where, you know, he addresses the bloodshed that's on their hands, but then he says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they'll be made white like wool. Though they're red like crimson, they will be like snow. I think this is what I saw in my dream, is that this thing cannot be erased, but it can be made white. I believe that there is a revival coming to this nation and I, I'm in pockets for sure, but I'm, I'm st are you guys still in faith for a revival in America? I don't know what it's going to look like. I feel like we, the whole church has been on pause for the last two years, but I still believe that God's not done with this nation. And I believe that there, there is a sound coming, a sound of revival that Though our sins are like scarlet, they will yet be white like wool. So this is the dream that started this for me. God gets a hold of you through dreams in a way that, and, and the way I've described it is this dream, it put a demand on me. Like I didn't know what to do with it, but I knew it was requiring something of me. And this is, this is what happens. And you're probably going to hear me say this a few times tonight is that it's through prayer that you kick up into a divine understanding of your role in the storyline. Most Christians go through their entire lives just waiting for something to happen and then get disappointed when they feel like nothing is happening. But in the place of prayer, it, you kick up into a divine understanding where the, heaven, the heavenly father tells you who you are and why you're here and what the good works are that he's prepared in advance for you to walk in. But, but prayer is the key. I think, I don't know of another way to kick up into that understanding. Prayer is the doorway. It's the key in the doorway that, 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 that you enter through to get into this kind of understanding. So for me, God gave me a dream, but then I had to walk that out. And so 18 years ago, we, I quit my career we sold our house, we got garage sailed our belongings, and we moved our family of six to Washington, D.C., and we moved into this, you know, uh, less than optimal condition setting <laughs> where we had uh, Lou Engel, his family, our family, another family, uh, about 100 people total. So about 70 young adults living in a community-type uh, environment and fueling this prayer movement, standing in front of the Supreme Court and running a house of prayer on Capitol Hill. So the dream is what started it for me. And uh, I'll just 
Maybe if we could go to that next image, just so you can kind of see what this has looked like through the years. Um, God gave us a dream at the very beginning, because it's like, how, how do you do this? Like, God, how do you want us to stand against abortion? And he gave us a dream where we were flying over Washington, D.C., and the, and the city was filled with people in the streets. And then the, the point of view zooms down to the Supreme Court, and they see that what we're doing is we're standing with a piece of duct tape over our mouth with the word life handwritten on it. And you could spend a million dollars in marketing and try really hard to figure out what that might represent, or you could just do the dream. Don't overthink this stuff. God, I tell you, this is kind of our, our marching orders here, and I share this with you tonight. Sometimes just do the dream. Do what God showed you in the dream, and then try to figure it out later. So we just began to move in obedience, and we began to stand in front of the Supreme Court with this red life tape on our mouths. You can go ahead and go to the next image. Uh, I don't know if you get to see that kind of stuff in Tucson. Do you get to see that? You guys go out and stand and get covered in snow? <laughs> yeah, only in books. <laughs> uh, you can go to the next image. So, you know, just so you can see it, like, sometimes we're there alone. Sometimes there's other crowds and protests going on. But this is what we've been doing is standing in silence. Now you say, wait a minute, why, do you, why don't you, you're supposed to speak up for the oppressed. You know, what are you doing standing in silence? In the obedience of just walking out this dream, we learned a few things about intercession and prayer. And uh, how many of you know who Reese Howells is? Oh, goodness. Okay. Some of the old saints know who Reese Howells is. All right, so here's your homework assignment. You need to read this old book called Reese Howells Intercessor. It's published in 1950. Reese Howells was a man of prayer that was used mightily by God really to direct and even dictate the outcomes of battles during World War II. And, and I, I think, you know, if Dutch Sheets and Cindy Jacobs were here, they would, they would tell you that it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that the fate of the entire world hinged on the prayers of that man and the young people that were with him. So that's an important figure that you should know about if you're a person of prayer. He taught that there are three stages to intercession. So intercession, that's, that's a fancy word, right? It's, it's not the same as prayer, but you know, it, it, I trust that maybe I don't have to explain it too much. You know, you read 1 Timothy 2, and it, uh, verses one to four, but it says that I urge you then, first of all, that all prayers, supplications, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all men, for kings and all those in authority. So New Testament biblical term here, intercession. But Reese Howells taught that uh, there are three stages to intercession. The first is identification. The second is agony. And the third is authority. And it goes in that order. Identification, agony, and then authority. You know, we didn't realize this when we first began to put on the tape, but what we came to understand is that this was how God wanted us to identify with the silence of the baby in the womb. By us voluntarily giving up our voice and, and bearing the reproach of the culture, uh, it was uh, a very effective way for God to take us to a, a much deeper place of prayer because the baby in the womb has no voice to defend themselves. And so for 18 years, we called this the silent siege. And so we would stand side by side and we would face the court. We, we don't lay siege to people. We, lay, we do lay siege to institutions that are out of alignment with God's will or ideologies that have exalted themselves against the knowledge of God. As Kim said earlier, it's like we're not here to wage war against flesh and blood. Amen. So people, it's hard to, you know, think of people uh, as your enemies, although some of them are. Um, but we did this uh, because we were compelled by love. Yeah, this wasn't an angry protest. We would actually stand, when people say, what are you protesting? We say, it's not a protest, it's a prayer meeting. That changes it. 
gives me a whole lot more license to stand in that public place. You know, we, if, I, if we had gone out with a bullhorn and screamed and yelled, we would have run out of words years ago. I, I've, that's another thing I've learned after 18 years is nobody wins a debate on the sidewalk. It's just, it's very difficult. But yeah, we didn't, God didn't send us out to, to go out and shout. He sent us out to go and pray and to intercede. And so for us, the life tape was a, was a powerful uh, method. And so it's different. It's different in every situation. What, the way Reese taught this is that uh, this, I, this element of identification, God will, will lead you in very unique ways so that when you enter into a deep prayer for someone or something, many times he'll introduce this element where you'll begin to experience the very thing that you're praying for. And, and, and that, that can turn a lot of people off if you don't understand what's going on. Like, let's say if you're, you're praying for, let's just create a hypothetical here. If you, let's say you have a family member that is chronically ill and you've been praying and it doesn't seem like anything's going on, but then you, you're praying and then all of a sudden you start feeling like you're not in tip-top shape. You start feeling ill. And sometimes that's just the attack of the enemy, but don't waste a good crisis. I'm convinced that this is how it works. God will allow you to enter into something so that you can identify in a better way with the very thing that you're praying for. And I say it this way, that sometimes God will, he'll, he'll let you go through the fire just so he can cook a prayer. Well, a few of you agree with that. Listen, this is hard. This is difficult because nobody wants to go through the fire. But God will allow you to experience certain things. He won't let you go beyond what you can bear, but he'll, he will allow you to experience certain things just so that you get that aha moment where you can identify. Think about it. Just think of it this way. Let's say uh, another hypothetical. If you've, if you, let's say you've struggled with addiction in your past and you get delivered. Aren't you, you're all, you know, right now, you're a lot more effective in praying for somebody who's struggling with that very thing right? Because you've experienced it and you, you now have experiential knowledge of God. You know the God that delivers out of that. Everyone else, it's a theory. You hear what I just said? For everybody else, it's just a theory. They read it and they hope that God can do it. But if you've gone through that and experienced it, you know the God who delivers. And you enter into a grace of faith that you can now put a demand on God in that area because you've experienced it yourself. Okay. So that's the identification stage. The next one, though, is really hard. And Reese called it agony. And the principle here is, what is it, John 12? Is it John 12? Yeah, John 12, verse 24. And it's the principle that the seed has to fall to the ground and die before fruit can be produced. And the, the way he taught this as it applies to prayer and intercession is that, and this is where I've been going with this tonight, is you have to learn how to lose. The thing that you're praying for, that itself has to fall to the ground and die. Unless something dies, there is no resurrection power. You see what I'm saying? And so Jesus taught them, taught the disciples this, that the, the kernel has to fall to the ground and die. Otherwise, there is no fruit produced. And the same is true for whatever it is you're praying for, that, it, that you're going to get to the point where it looks like nothing is working. In fact, it'll actually look like the opposite is happening. Now, listen, I'm all, we all love answered prayer. We, love, we live for the moment, right, when, when God answers prayer. And sometimes you, you pray for something and it happens immediately. That's awesome. But there's other times. And I would dare say the things that are more consequential, when, when there is more at stake and failure is not an option, right, it's, it's, it's live or die scenario, 
that then it's like you pray and it's not even that nothing happens. It's more like the opposite happens. And that can be soul crushing in, unless you have God's perspective on this, unless you have that John 12 perspective, knowing going into it that something's got to die. But this is, this, is, this is what intercessors do. They say it's over my dead body. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus is the intercessor. Anything that we do, we're just following his example. We're modeling after him. And he hangs on the cross and says, it's over my dead body. There is no victory. There is no fruit unless something dies. And so Reese would teach on this and he called it agony. And, and this has been one of the hardest aspects of the last 18 years is learning how to lose and experience the sting of that agony without quitting. Because here's what happens many times is that when, it, when the opposite happens or when you feel that sting, you kind of pull away from it and you'll reason your way out of the situation. You'll come up with a whole bunch of creative ideas and reasons why that must not have been God's will and you'll go do something else. Meanwhile, somebody still needs a breakthrough back here and they needed you not to give up. But, but our whole culture is, is built around not feeling pain. Why do you think there's an opioid crisis in America? Like our whole culture is, is conditioned to not want to feel pain. And, and that spills over into our spiritual lives that we want immediate gratification. We want it to come quick and easy and not cost us anything. And if it hurts, we don't want to feel it. Pastor, it's quiet in here now. Could you uh, put up the next image for me, please? I'll give you a, an example of uh, something that happened with us and the way, the way God put a real fine point on this so that we understood it. So we had been praying for about 12 years, and there was a really big opportunity, a case, a, a legal case that we had been praying for for about two years, and I don't mean like casually praying. I'm talking about like 40-day fasts, like contending prayer, relentlessly, nonstop for two years, praying for the success of this case as it worked its way up through uh, the court system. It takes two years for anything to get to the Supreme Court. And... On uh, June 28th, 2016, the ruling came out. We Guys, just being honest, we were in faith that we had won coming up to this day. And we get to that day and we lost and we lost big. And so this is the front page of USA Today, which I think is just kind of poetic. And if you look at the picture uh, with all the purple there, the big picture, those are, that's the pro-abortion side who won. And then below them, the smaller picture, that's us. <laughs> Standing there in the red life tape. And you can't really see it because it's kind of small on the screen, but you see the first person, then the second person, the, the young lady. The third person, that's me. The one with my head down like this. <laughs> That's me. We became the poster children in America for losers. Literally, the front page of USA Today, we were the losers. And that hurt. Not because I can't, I don't give a rip about how we look, good or bad. It hurt because it was two years of contending in faith and we lost. If you could go to the next image, this one made it in even more poignant. Pro-choice victory, pro-life, what's the word? Agony. Oh, that's when it all came into focus for me. I've been studying the teachings of Reese Howells for years, and then all of a sudden, there it was on the front page of the newspaper. Not only were we the poster, the national poster children for losers, but this was our agony moment. 
This is when like the prophetic clarity came because here's the way I interpret it. Okay, this is good. If this is our agony moment, I now know that we're transitioning into the place of authority. But oh, it hurt. <laughs> it hurt bad. Um, I want to share a, another dream with you. The, here's what I can say about getting to that moment. And we'll come full circle back to the first moment that I showed you at the beginning of the evening. But to get to, to this moment right here, you know, you start asking the question, uh, was it worth it? And this is the point if, that, honestly, many Christians turn away and abandon the whole thing. And, and I can't tell you how many people that we've seen come and go through the years where they just decide that this doesn't work. This thing that you're doing, this doesn't work. If this worked, we wouldn't still be here after 12 years and have nothing to show for it. Now, certainly there were positive things happening over the last decade, but nothing that was challenging the big stuff. You understand what I mean? That Roe v. Wade was the law of the land for 49 years, and in 49 years, no one had challenged Roe v. Wade. Did you know that? Anytime you heard about a pro-life matter or a case or something, it was all little, little smaller things that were just chipping away at this, but Roe v. Wade was the law of the land, and we were told that that will never change. We were told that was settled law. And so... You know, people would abandon the whole endeavor and say, this, this doesn't work, and I'm not going to waste my time on it. And it was during this time, uh, a friend of ours had a dream. And in the dream, they were facing off against this massive giant, like 100-foot-tall giant. And they look, and in their hand, they're holding a little hammer. And they go up, and they strike the giant with this hammer, and nothing happens. And then they hit it again. In the dream, they hit the giant 100 times. And on the 100th hit, the thing shatters and falls to pieces. And in the dream, the Lord asked, which hit was the most important? All of them. If you stop at 99, you don't get the victory. It's a profound dream. Which one's the most important? Every single one. See, here's the other thing is that, you know, I talked about like, we don't want to feel pain. You will have people in your life, whatever it is you're praying for, and if it's beginning to cost you something, and it's costly, you'll have people in your, that will want to speak in your life Things that sound like wisdom and they'll say, you're trying too hard. You know, you, sh you need to like relax, man. Like, like, don't take this so seriously. You know, you're striving, you know, let God be God. And, you know, and you need, you need to just kind of like take care of yourself. I'll tell you what, church, we have idolized self-care. Nobody amen that one. <laughs> But it'll sound like wisdom, but there's something about this dream that has captured my imagination. Every hit is the most important. And so I can say this with a little bit of, with, with spiritual integrity, that every time we had an opportunity to swing at this thing, we gave it everything we had. We didn't reserve ourselves and say, well, let's, let's not try real hard on this one because we need to save some energy for later. I don't think that we get where we need to go if we're, if we're hedging our bets. That's not faith. It's not faith if you're just scaling back the engagement so that it's something that fits into your schedule. This isn't what you came tonight expecting, is it? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm giving you like 18 years of just... Ugh. <laughs> so... 
This dream, this dream was important, but I remember after that moment, I, I was, uh, I called Dutch Sheets. Do you guys know who Dutch Sheets is? And um, I called him and, and I said, man, I, I thought we had this. And, you know, you kind of go through these, you know, low places, you know, and you need, you need somebody that can pick you up. <laughs> and I called Dutch and uh, he, he, you know, he's a straight shooter. <laughs> And he says, Matt, you have to believe in the principle of the bowls. That's it. That's all he said. Bye. And then he hung up. <laughs> that, that statement marked me. Do you know what he means by this? You have to believe in the principle of the bowls. All right. Do you have your Bibles with you? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter five, verse eight. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. What Dutch was referencing was this passage that this is not colorful language or a metaphor. This is a heavenly reality that there are golden bowls in heaven that have captured your prayers. Do you understand that your prayers don't evaporate over time? Things that you were praying for 10 years ago, do you know that that stuff, if it was prayed in faith, that stuff is still alive before the throne and it's just waiting for its moment. So Duchess is, is talking about this and let's uh, skip over now to Revelation chapter 8. We'll get a little bit more of the picture. Revelation 8, verses 3. I'm going to read verses 3 to 5. It says, And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense and the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. It's a very dramatic scene. But the amazing part is this, is that your prayers are kept in golden bowls and they are a part of that scene. So when Dutch said, you have to believe in the principle of the bowls, it's not just that the bowls exist and that God didn't throw away your prayers. The principle of the bowls is that at some point the bowls are going to get tipped over. Amen. Have you ever heard that phrase? Tip, hear, hear an old saint pray and say, God, tip the bowls. And you're like, I don't know what they're talking about. This is what they're talking about is that all the prayers that have accumulated through years have now reached a moment and we're asking God now tip that bowl out because this is what we see in that scene of Revelation 8 is the angel gathers up all that, mingles it with fire from the altar and it gets hurled to the earth. That is a picture of answered prayer. Do you understand that you, what answered prayer looks like is it shakes the earth. Peals of thunder, rumblings, and earthquakes. This is the power of the prayers that we are praying when we pray in faith, is they are waiting for a moment when they get hurled to the earth in answer, and it shakes the very foundations of the planet. That changes our view of prayer, doesn't it, a little bit? So my question to you is this, is you must see yourself in this storyline. You have to find yourself in that storyline. What storyline? All right, so let's zoom out a little bit here. I want to read a little bit more of this scene that those two passages introduce us to. Can we just read a few long passages? Is that okay? All right. I'm going to read first from Daniel chapter 7. If you're taking notes, I'm going to read verses 13 to 14. And he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days as, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory 
and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel sees this in a vision. We know the, the one that looks like a son of man. We know who is, what his identity is, don't we? We know who that is. That's Jesus. What's startling about the scene is he sees, he says, he doesn't say one that looked like the son of God. He says, I saw one that looked like a son of man. This is a shocking image that Daniel begins to describe that a human, a man, is entering into this scene. Now, another angle, if you could think of it that way, another angle on the same scene is Revelation 5. So I, we read the little bit about the bull, but let's read a little bit more of the context. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, before I go any further, this would be the easiest way to understand what that thing is. The, the scroll with the seals, that's the title deed of the earth. Just put that in the back of your head. That's, that's an easy way to understand what, what we're talking about here. Verse 2. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. This is a profound scene. It's the same scene that Daniel is seeing where the son of man approaches the ancient of days. Revelation tells us that he's holding the title deed to the earth and it's given to Jesus. And in that moment, the whole liturgy uh, falls flat on its face before this one, the only one who was found worthy. We sang it tonight. He's the only one that's worthy to read that scroll and to open its seals. But there's this, another, there's this other element in the mix, and it's those bowls. Have you ever read it and looked at it this way? This is what I mean when I say you have to find yourself in the story. That's not just this amazing heavenly sci-fi scene that's playing out, you're in that storyline. The bowls, they're holding the bowls. The bowls are in that scene and the bowls are filled with the prayers of the saints. That's what you're praying right here. It's what you were praying this afternoon. It's what you were praying 10 years ago. You're a part of that storyline. And this is what I love about how God shares the, his, his divine governance. Do you realize that God governs the earth through prayer and intercession? Go to Psalm 2. It's another view of this same scene. Twelve verses. Like, memorize Psalm 2. Like, this is an amazing scene because it's where the kings are conspiring together. They don't want anything to do with the restraint that God has put on them. God laughs at their conspiracy plans. But then, 
we go right back into the same scene. And in uh, verse uh, eight and nine, the ancient of days, the father says to this one, his son. See, now we know the secret identity. It's his son. It's not just one that looks like a man. It's not this lamb with seven eyes. Psalm 2 tells us who it is. It's his son. But it's the same scene. And he says this, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. That's why I say this, what he's holding is the title deed to the earth. We, we know that he approaches and the father gives that scroll he gives the title deed to his son but how does this all happen he goes on well verse 9 says you shall break them with a rod of iron dash into pieces like a potter's vessel but what's happening in this exchange i exchange i love this he says ask and i will give god governs the earth through prayer and intercession this is how jesus governs the earth ask the father says ask and i will give he is the great intercessor, but it's no different for us. And it does, I'm not talking like this is exclusively just for like big stuff, whatever big stuff is. Listen, if you need a breakthrough, there's no such thing as a small breakthrough. Is there? If you need a breakthrough, it looks gigantic. So this is, it's all scalable from the no matter what we're talking about, whether it's a matter going on in your personal life, maybe it's at work, maybe it's something going on in your family, maybe it's something going on in the city, or the, maybe in the nation, or the nations. Boy, that we could go there tonight if we wanted to. God still governs the earth through prayer and intercession. So you have to see yourself in the storyline, and this is what I meant earlier when prayer is the key, prayer is the doorway, where, how you enter into a divine understanding of your role in the whole thing. Guys, you're in that scene. You're there, do you see yourself there? So I don't know, I saw the four living creatures, they're pretty cool. The elders, they're there. The lamb with the seven eyes is there, that's kind of weird. <laughs> the father's there, the ancient of days. You're there. They're all holding golden bowls filled with the stuff that you've been praying. And I just think that's so wildly inspiring <laughs> that we're a part of that heavenly liturgy. We're a part of this scene. But here's the, the other thing that we need to understand, though, as, as prayer warriors and intercessors, is that it doesn't all just get saved for the end. Now, I can say this without a doubt, that all the prayers get answered by the end. I, nothing gets chucked out. Like nobody's prayers evaporate. By the end, everything gets answered, but not everything waits until the end to get answered. The stuff, it, it, it awaits its appointed time. Some things God is answering right now. Now, I, we went into this to pray for the ending of abortion. And I said, you know, Lord, even if you don't, if, if, if Roe v. Wade isn't overturned, if America doesn't do this on her own volition, I know you're gonna do it when you come back. But, I, I, but my cry was, God, don't, I don't wanna wait until then. Like, because I know you're coming back with a rod of iron that's gonna dash the nations to pieces like, like Picture that in your head, like, like pottery and a, and a rod of iron smashing things. The way I always looked at this is I don't want Jesus to have to smash this. I want to contend in my generation to see things, justice released in the earth at its appointed time. Amen? So we have to go into this knowing that not everything waits until the end. This is why you hear them old saints say, tip the bowls, right? There are things that need to happen now. There's, there are things that need to happen in Arizona right now. There's things that desperately need to happen in the United States now. And we are a part of this storyline. And it's almost, it, you know, this is kind of reading between the lines a little bit, but if you could just, Go with me here. The picture is like these bowls are being filled. They're being filled. They're being filled. And it's almost like 
the, an, an appointed time is when it's completely full, right? Can, does that make sense? And it's almost like when it gets completely full, it, that's when it starts to, to tip or slosh a little bit. I don't know. You understand what I'm saying, though, is that that's the appointed time. The goal is the, to fill those bowls. And so if you stop when it gets hard, you'll never fill that bowl. See what I'm saying? If, if, if you stop just because it seems like you're not getting anywhere, that bowl will never be filled. But this is what's so amazing about this scene that we've been camped out on here a little bit tonight is that it's only then, like what it's describing, we get the end time picture because he wants us to understand what the scene is all about. The scene is complete. Now go here with me. The host of heaven falls down. They're awestruck at the sight of a man assuming this supreme position over all things. There he stands with the scroll in his hand and the bowls are full. Do you get this? The scene is only complete when the bowls are full. Oh, I, I, we, we need to understand this. If you don't understand what I'm saying right now, you, you won't keep praying. This ought to inspire us. It's meant to inspire us. God wants you to know that you are a part of this scene and you should not give up. How many of you believe that Jesus is coming back? How many of you understand that he's not coming back until the bowls are full? Ian Bounds said it this way, ages of millennial glory have been indefinitely postponed by a prayerless church. Oh my gosh. Like I don't, my heart can't even like process what he's saying there. Age, meaning like the coming of the, the, the coming of the son of God back to the earth and the, and the beginning of the next age has been indefinitely postponed because of a prayerless church. The bowls are not being filled. Well, I take that very seriously. God has uh, given us a grace to continue. And you know, I, 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 I wanted to, to go into a little bit of the detail, but I'm, I'm thinking about not now, just for the sake of time. Is, are we ending at 8.30? Is that correct? Okay. Um, Oh, you prayer people are all the same. <laughs> After this moment, things did begin, begin to change from our perspective. And uh, uh, if it's okay with you, like I need, to, I need to like venture out into the weeds just a little bit. I, I understand that not everybody here follows politics. A lot of people don't want to think about it, don't care about it. Um, this is not political talk. And, and I'm not a, a political person, um, but I live in Washington, D.C., and so I have to deal with this stuff nonstop. So after this moment, this was 2016, this happened at the same time as another pretty significant event. Um, I was uh, traveling to Dallas, Texas to uh, speak at a church there. And I got off the airplane, it was February 13th of 2016, and I got off the airplane and all the TVs had the same thing playing as I got off the plane. Uh, a Supreme Court justice had died unexpectedly. It was a man named Antonin Scalia. Uh, he, was, he was a lion on the court, pro-life, amazing, uh, somebody that we had prayed for for many years, and he died. And uh, that, was, that was tough because it was 2016, and we knew what to expect in that moment. So to have, if, if you could, I don't like to do this, but if you can think of the court that there are some judges that are conservative in their judicial philosophy and some who are more progressive in their judicial philosophy, I trust I don't have to explain that to you. And um, Scalia was one uh, on the conservative side of the court, a traditionalist and a constitutionalist, and, uh, and pro-life. So to lose him and face the prospect of him being replaced by someone that 
uh, felt differently was, was difficult because again, we're coming, you know, we're in this agony moment and it's one big grand experiment at this point. 12 years of prayer has led to this. This is going to bury it for another generation. You understand what I'm saying? Like it, like this was very serious. And so, uh, went to church the next morning. It was Valentine's day. And, um, uh, uh, spoke that morning and, and, and was feeling the weight of the world and then went to lunch after church. And I get a phone call and it's Cindy Jacobs. How many of you know who Cindy Jacobs is? A couple of you. <laughs> and she, she called and said, where are you? And I said, well, I'm at this restaurant. She said, stay there. I've got the word of the Lord. And so she comes to the restaurant and prophesies over me. And uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> a little awkward too. And, uh, but she came and she gave me this prophetic word. She said, your job is to hold that seat open. The one uh, the, for the justice that just died. So your job is to hold that seat open. And then she said this in the prophetic word. She, she said, God says that I have prepared my champion and I am now ready to bring my champion up to this seat. So hold the, court for, hold the seat for me and hold the seat for my champion. And then she left. And then I had to go back to DC and we began to pray and, um, uh, almost immediately, uh, president Obama nominated uh, a man named Merrick Garland for that seat. And this was somebody that we did not believe had the right judicial philosophy for the court. And for a year we prayed to keep that seat open. And if you're, Politically minded, you may know that there were a lot of dynamics that went on. All I can say is I'm here to, tonight to tell you from my perspective, we held that seat open for exactly 50 weeks. And, and we, had, uh, all, we had the nine justices hanging on the wall of our prayer room and the one empty one, and we put a, a reserved tag on the empty one and every day we would stand in the prayer room and we would say, nobody sits in that seat except the champion. Now remember what I said about do the dream. Listen, sometimes you get a prophetic word. Don't try to figure it out. Just do the prophetic word. And so I, because there was no figuring this one out, because I don't know if you guys remember, but it was a pretty much a 99% lock that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election in 2016. So what do you mean that we're supposed to keep the seat open? You understand what I'm saying? Guys, this was difficult. This is when everything looks like it's going the opposite direction. That happened in the middle of that. And God, like, we felt the sting of the agony. And here we are. It looked like a dead-end street. Like, what do you mean i got to hold this open? And i got to pray this certain way. And there's absolutely no way that this can happen. There's no there's no options here. Like, we're toast. But we prayed. And we would stand. And daily we would say, nobody sits in the seat except the champion. Well, one thing led to another. And for some, you know, for a number of reasons, uh, Merrick Garland was never brought up for confirmation on that seat. And for almost a year, it was 50 weeks exactly to the day that the election went a different direction. And then uh, uh, President Trump had uh, put out, okay, <laughs> know your audience, okay. <laughs> he had put out a list and said, these are the 25 people, if I'm elected, these are the 25 people that I would put on the Supreme Court. And then after he won the election, he narrowed it down to eight. And then he narrowed it down to five, and then he narrowed it down to three. And we were in the prayer room one day, and there was a, there was a guy on our team who was a Native American. And he said, uh, you know, as we were praying about it, he goes, well, I'm going to look at the three names. And, you know, the meaning of names is important. So I, he felt led by the Lord to go look up the meanings of the, the names of the three. And he looks them up, and he looks up the name of uh, the first one on the list, and it was a guy named Neil Gorsuch. And the name Neil means champion. That's crazy. For a year, we had been praying 
and, and declaring over that empty seat, nobody sits in this seat except the kneel. Literally, we had been praying for him by name and didn't even know it. I called Cindy and she says, well, there you go. <laughs> and so Neil Gorsuch was confirmed to that empty seat. But now the court is still the same. The makeup of the court did not change. Uh, then, you know, a year later, um, there was another, there was a retirement, there was another vacancy. Brett Kavanaugh was nominated and that was, that was a circus uh, for him to be put on the court. But God had given us another word. We had been praying for the champion, but God told us that he was going to put a reformer on the court a reformer. And we thought, well, I wonder who that's going to be. But for, you know, if I could back up just a little bit, he, the Lord had spoken to us the name Amy Coney Barrett. And we had been praying for her by name for three and a half years. As we were praying for her, she actually was nominated for one of the circuit courts. She had been at uh, Notre Dame in Indiana She's, uh, well, man, I could say so much about her. She got nominated for that, that uh, vacancy on the circuit court in Chicago, and she got confirmed by the Senate on October 31st of uh, 2018, which was Reformation Day, but it was also the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and we said, we think she's the reformer but she just got put on the circuit court. How are we gonna get her up to the Supreme Court? How many years is that gonna take? You know the rest of the story. On uh, September 18th of 2020, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away and right before the elections of 2020, President Trump nominated Amy Coney Barrett for that seat and that was so significant because for the first time since we got to this court, the makeup of the court changed. It shifted. Up until that point, it had always been just a one-for-one -one trade out. Listen, we, we, in the 18 years we've been there, we've prayed through 10 nominations and eight confirmations to the court, almost a complete turnover of the court. The only one that's still there that was there when we got there is Clarence Thomas. We prayed through every other replacement, but it had always been sort of a one for one trade out. When Amy Coney Barrett was seated on the court, that was the first time that the makeup of the court shifted and you know the rest of the story. This case came up out of Mississippi. It was the Dobbs case. Again, we felt led, look, look up, what's the name Dobbs mean? It means the fiery man prayed for a year. God, come as the fiery man into the furnace of this court and stand and have your way. Come on. And so the Dobbs case is the case that ultimately uh, overturned Roe v. Wade. And uh, we knew it was going to happen a year in advance because it was June of 2021. I was with Cindy Jacobs again. That's a scary lady. Man. You, you think you want a prophetic word from Cindy. Trust me, you don't. Like it usually requires a lot of work. <laughs> but we were, we were talking and she was asking me for an update on the Dobbs case. This is a fun story. And I said, well, the state's brief is due at the court on July 22nd. And immediately she prophesied to me again. She said, July 22nd, it's 722. You need to begin to pray and prophesy Daniel 722 over the Dobbs case. Daniel 7, 22, do you know what that is? So in that scene, the enemy is beating the saints. The saints are losing. But in, at 7, 22, God flips the script and changes the storyline. It says that the ancient of days is seated and a verdict is rendered in favor of the saints, and the saints possess the kingdom. What she was telling me, she said, you need to begin to prophesy that over the Dobbs case, that the verdict will change and be rendered in favor of the saints. So we began to pray, and then sure enough, 
the, uh, the state of Mississippi submitted their brief on 722. And we had prayed, God, change the legal strategy to overturn Roe. And when they submitted their brief on 722, they, had, they changed their legal strategy from the previous two years of arguing their position. And they said, nope, now that we think about it, Roe v. Wade is egregiously wrong. And they called for the overturning of Roe. Listen, God governs the earth through prayer and intercession. Ask and I will give. This was an appointed time by God. The pro-life movement doesn't get this victory. We don't get the victory, certainly. God gets the victory. This was the appointed time of answered prayer. The bowls were filled. And the bowls got tipped. I want to tell you one last story to give you faith. And then if the worship team wants to come up, uh, I have a little special treat that uh, we're going to close this meeting with. I was asking the Lord, you know, you know, why did it take so long? And uh, do you guys remember the pandemic? <laughs> it's true, yeah. Um, at the beginning of 2020, Carrie Job, she's a worship uh, artist, musician, songwriter. She and some other artists, they wrote, they sit down to write a song, and what they were led to do was they actually turned to the ironic priestly blessing of uh, number six, is number 624, and, and, and uh, they wrote that song, The Blessing. Now, no doubt you guys have sang it here. Here's what happened, though, is they wrote that song. It, it was a very popular song, but immediately the whole world went into lockdown. And for two years, as the church shifted to web streaming and people were participating in church in their homes, that song got sung all over America. Now that's significant because it says, can we just read it real quick before we sing it? Let's read it. Numbers, uh, or yeah, number six, starting in verse 24, it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. I think this was so significant that for two years, the church sang this song over every home in America. For two years, this priestly blessing was pronounced over this nation. And then it hit me that God reversed the curse of abortion on June 24th, 624. The priestly blessing is Numbers 624. Now you think, oh, that's just a coincidence. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think God is answering your prayers and I thought, I'm sure that a hundred people have pointed that out to Carrie. But I thought, I'm going to tell her anyway. So we contacted Carrie Job, and we shared that with her. And she said, oh my goodness, no one has pointed that out. She said, this is so significant because my mom was counseled to abort me. She was supposed to be aborted and her mom chose life. And I, I've... I don't share that lightly. I have Carrie's permission to share that publicly because that's obviously a very personal story. But how significant of a moment is this? Would you stand with me? This is what uh, we've been doing is we've been singing the blessing almost nonstop since, since June. And this song is not just a benediction to stick on the end of something. It says that, that when we... When we pronounce this, this is how we put God's name on a nation and, the, and the, the, his blessing can be released on a people. And I, this song really has become like a worship warfare song for us. And I want us, if we can, to sing this tonight. And even as we enter into this, and thank you for doing this on the fly. I really appreciate it because <laughs> I didn't give him any warning. But as we sing this, like let your thoughts... Go to your own families. 
but I want you to see, I want you to see yourself in the storyline of what God is doing right now in this nation. So it's not just your family. A blessing on your family is unto a greater blessing on a generation. And so you see it. God wants you to see yourself in the storyline. What you're praying for is not, it's, it's, God's not going to fasten your soul to a dead end dream. God is taking you to the place. If you won't quit, he's taking you to the place, I believe, of answered prayer and fulfillment. And you'll look in that moment and you'll say, oh, the reality is, is far greater than anything I imagined. Pinch me. I must be dreaming. As we sing this tonight and close the meeting out, just let's pray this over our own families. Pray it over this church. Pray it over this city. Pray it over a generation. Because listen, we all focus too much on generational curses and they're powerful. They can go to three and four generations, but generational blessings are to a thousand generations. God's blessings are far more powerful than any curse of the enemy. Amen. And I believe we're in a moment right now where God is answering prayers. Bowls are being filled. Amen. Let's sing.